All right, Robert, good to go. Okay, great. Thank you, Megan. All right. Good, in, good afternoon, everyone. It is one o'clock, so we're going to start today's session. Uh, getting started with artificial intelligence. So this is the first in a series uh, that FACT2 is offering, the FACT2 task group on AI. And uh, so come back next week, another topic, another topic, different presenters giving different angles on everything. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm here just to get you, you know, we get you up and running. If you're not familiar with AI, if you haven't pressed the buttons yet, that's what this session is about. If you have more experience, you know, please stay in. You know, uh, what we found in the Tuesday session is uh, there were questions coming into the chat that I didn't have to answer because people uh, who have been playing with it got to answer before I did. So a great organic exchange of knowledge. All right. So uh, myself, Robert Becker, uh, Fact two representative, that's my newest hat. Uh, along with that, I am an instructional designer at SUNY Broom. And some of you might have been in my sessions before when I worked for the SUNY Center for Professional Development and for SUNY Online as DLE trainer for our big transition into Brightspace. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's move on. What we're going to do today. Let me just move something here in my screen. There we go. Okay, so our path. So we'll do frame of reference. We'll do a little introduction here. We'll do some history, some background about AI. How new is it? How new isn't it? Uh, then we'll get into some basic putting GPT to work. And here we're going to work with a specific AI. Uh, and then we'll talk about that. Then we'll segue into a little bit more involved usage if you're comfortable with just the basics of it. And then... Uh, additional possibilities. For parts two and three, you'll have the opportunity to click along and to play in GPT at the same time. Uh, but then part three, I'll just like discuss a few of the options if you wanna go beyond. And then next steps, we're gonna tie things up and give you, you know, point you in a direction towards other res resources that you can find. All right, so cards on the table, about me. Okay, you've, you've got the bio, you've got the professional bio. So lifelong educator. I actually started teaching guitar as a teenager. And uh, I've gone back, uh, I've gotten my history degree, I've taught history since then, and then I went back again and got my instructional design degree. So I'm looking at things from a few different angles. And you'll notice, you know, there's some liberal arts in there. I love the liberal arts approach. Uh, it forces me to look at things from as many angles as possible. I mentioned that I trained for... Uh, DLE, you know, DLE trainer. Myself, my attitude is I'm a technological pragmatist. Uh, so when a new technology comes out, I don't blindly embrace it. I don't blindly shut it down. I cautiously, logically take steps to investigate and see, will it work for me or will it not? The reason is I was actually raised in a house with technology. Uh, in 1993, one of my older siblings published her PhD thesis on artificial intelligence. So that answers the question of, is it new? No, it's not. And you know, it's been around longer than that, for sure. Uh, so one of my sisters published that thesis. Uh, at the same time, my older brother was uh, busy working, teaching a chess program, how to bend the rules and try and get away with moves that you shouldn't be able to get away with and see if the human notices. Uh, and... If you want to know why I went into liberal arts, well, from my standpoint, it looked like computers were, were fault. It looked like that field was clogged between them and dad and mom. Uh, yeah, I went a different path. So my focus is what's the possibility? Okay. Um, you know, what can we do with it? You know, uh, will it work for us? Will it not? I'm not saying everybody should always use AI for everything. I'm saying, look at your field, look at your classroom. Does it lend itself to that? What kind of a world are your students going to go into? Will they need to know this? For example, 99% of the Fortune 500 magazines are now using AI, or not Fortune 500 magazines, Fortune 500 companies, pardon me, are now using AI. So if you have students going into uh, a field that is involved in Fortune 500 companies, uh, the people hiring them are going to look for people with AI experience. Okay. So let's move on. First off, what is artificial intelligence? 
AI, that term is getting thrown around a lot right now. And there are different levels of AI, different powers of AI. Uh, but basically what it comes down to is AI is a tool, another in a long line of tools. And it's a knowledge tool, right? So we can track knowledge tools. The abacus is a knowledge tool. Abacus, dictionaries, encyclopedias, things that store knowledge for us so we can come back and get them later. But then if you look at you know examples below that, calculators, computer code, educational apps, things that we put information into it, and it gives us results. It gives us something else. AI does that just on a very powerful level. Notable uh, predecessors, okay, the talk right now, apart from AI, is GPT, 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 right? Uh, but if you want to track it, the ELISA program, named for ELISA Doolittle, uh, MIT brought that out in 1966. In the 80s, Deep Blue by IBM was going up against Gary Kasparov in chess matches and winning. Uh, Dr. Sabido. Now that one, you don't hear too much about. That was put out by a company named Sound Blaster, and they did sound cards and things like that. And Sound Blaster put out this program, this uh, precursor to AI, based on language modeling, that was a counselor. It was a, you know, a cartoon, an image counselor on your screen that you would talk to and you would present problems and it would give, you know, feedback, but it was very limited. The reason I included that one is when that one came out, it caused a ripple through the counseling world. It caused fear and trepidation. The fear was that Dr. Sabido was going to replace counselors. It did not, right? not even close. It couldn't do what a human could do. Uh, it would uh, answer questions. Well, how do you feel about that? Or how does that make you feel? It would throw things back at you. If you swore at it, it was known to just shut down. Okay, So things like that. Uh, Alice uh, came along, 95, we have Alice. Uh, another step in the evolution from Eliza. Hey, you may have heard of Tay. As we deal with AI, oftentimes we, we hear about the ghost stories, you know, the, the horrible things that go wrong or the things that could go wrong. I'm not a fan of ghost stories. But I put Tay in here for a reason. Tay was a Twitter chat bot created by Microsoft. And you may have heard of Tay because what happened with Tay was Tay was put into Twitter to have discussions. And within a day or so, uh, well, it learned to echo what it was hearing and it became it started echoing horribly racist things and just you know misogynistic things because that's what the trolls online were feeding it. The reason I put Tay in here is Tay is the lesson of not connecting your AI directly to the internet. And if you're wondering why GPT, once you get into it, is not connected directly to the internet, I think it has a lot to do with that, a safety buffer. Uh, Microsoft had Sydney, they moved on to something else, okay. Um, I see the chat's moving. Cool. I'll, I'll check for questions, but if you're, yeah, we got information going. Good. Uh, Naren, thank you for posting that. Okay. Yep. If you have information, please throw it in the chat. Okay, folks. And then the last one on the list, chat GPT-3. Because oftentimes we just abbreviate and we say GPT. Well, currently we're working with the free version is 3.5. The pay version is 4. So there's a history back before that. 3.5 went live in November of 22. Okay. Uh, but three went live in June of 2020. We just didn't hear about it. We had other things going on. And before three, there was GPT-2, which came out in 2019. But that one came out and was quickly pulled back. They realized it was not ready. I haven't dive, you know, dove in deep enough to find out the history of one or anything like that yet. But I just want to let you know that while we had this explosion in media and in our discussions and in higher ed and in educational offerings about AI that started with 3.5, didn't come out of nowhere. Okay, there's a history and there's been a steady process of like, experiment, pull it back if it's too far or if it does too much. Uh, or if it's not doing what they want it to. GPT-5 was originally scheduled to come out in December of last year, but it has been put off. It is, uh, theoretically, word is it's going to come out sometime this year. We don't know when. And it is supposed to have advanced reasoning capabilities and um, rumored to have video function, the ability to create videos. 
So we'll see. Maybe that's why they pulled it back. Maybe they're not liking the results they're seeing with that yet. Okay. Now, a little bit more to give you context. As far as uh, AI is not new, now we're talking about AI is uh, around us, and we might already be using it without knowing it. Apple has Siri Assistant. Amazon has Alexa. Duolingo is now using GPT-4 to give you better results when you try to learn a language and you're getting things wrong. Grammarly is using GPT-3, maybe 3.5 now. Uh, Khan Academy has Conmigo. Canva, if you design things in Canva, they have tied into Dolly, which is made by the same uh, entity that makes uh, chat GPT called OpenAI. Okay. Uh, uses Dolly, uses Imagine. Uh, okay. And then I mentioned chat GPT, that's OpenAI, Dolly, OpenAI, Gemini by Google, Copilot by Microsoft. So here comes the other thing that leads to some trepidation is what's called, it's called the tyranny of choice. If you haven't heard that term, the greatest example of it is Netflix. The idea of there can be un, you know, almost unlimited, there can be a very wide range of things for you to view, and yet you feel like there's nothing to watch. Right? So that is something that gets in people's way when they start or when they want to start with AI. And that's why I say, uh, well, what we're going to do here is we'll play with GPT, the most prevalent one, the most common one. Uh, so you'll get a solid foundation point, and then you can branch out to other ones as you go. But if you are more comfortable with Google or Microsoft, Gemini, Copilot, the other ones are out there. You can play in those just as well. So I need you to do me a favor. In the chat, let's get a sense of where we're coming in from. So on a scale one to four, uh, using chat GPT, no experience, tried it once or twice, use it repeatedly, you know, or use it on a regular basis. Okay, I'm watching this come in. We're getting a great mix. Excellent. Okay, great. So a lot of threes and fours. I uh, believe what, what happened on Tuesday when I ran the analysis on it, it came out with a split. We had like 50% one and two, 50% three and four. So it looks like we're about in the same situation here. Awesome. So a lot of you are going to get new information. Some of you are going to get a different way to look at something you've already seen. And uh, anyone who has information, if you're in the four zone or something, and you want to share it, again, please put it in the chat. We do this together. Okay, so before we jump in, let's do some best practices, some tips. So if you're new to uh, AI, or if you just did the whole, you know, leap first, look later thing, uh, let's look at a few considerations. Okay. Um, so pay and free options. You're going to find in chat GPT, you're going to find 3.5 is free, 4 is pay. The main difference is being, well, 4, you have better access. Sometimes you can't get to GP, GPT 3.5 if there's too many people using it. You know, it has a delay and you have to wait. Uh, 4 gets you better access. Four can take more information in. If you are using four and you want to enter text into it for analysis, uh, four will give you about, say, 6,000 words, depending on your words. They do it by tokens, I believe it is. Uh, but it equates out to like 6,000 words. If you're using 3.5, it'll give you about, you can put in about 3,000 words for analysis. So keep that in mind. Four also has other tie-ins to say Dolly or um, you know other things that it can do beyond what 3.5 can do. But my recommendation is always start with the free, see what you can do with it before you put any money out there. Okay. Uh, password safety considerations. Uh, I'm going to suggest that your passwords, your logins, if you're new to GPT and you're creating an account, don't use a password you use with anything else, especially with SUNY. Uh, higher education is one of, if not the most targeted uh, arenas by hackers because of the amount of information and this, the kind of information, financial records, medical records, a long history of students. 
you know, the campus I'm working on now, Broom, they still have all my records from when I was a student many decades ago. All right, so all of that is out there. So keep that in mind. Uh, whenever you work with any AI, consider what they do for data collection. What are you know, what is their privacy stance? Now, as I go through this, some of this might be ringing a bell. These are the best practice considerations for using apps, for using websites, right? Adobe, do you need to use the pay version of Adobe if free is getting you what you, what you want? Right? Are you going to use the same password that you use for, say, Duolingo or something that you're going to use for your financial institutions? I hope not, right? Uh, data collection, well, we've seen that problem. Um, we see that problem. Okay, I see the chat, but we'll go over there in a second. Um, right, so data collection, privacy considerations. What are they collecting and why? Okay, chat, GPT, open AI statement is that they, um, they use the information you put in plus the results that it fires back to you to help improve and gauge, are they giving people the responses they want? All right, that's their stance. Still, you want to be careful because your, your searches will get saved in your account. And you can delete them, but they will get saved in your account. And just like anything else, it can be hacked. Okay. So keep it in mind. And then the last one, know your sources. When you're considering an AI, consider who made it. OpenAI had a tie-in with Microsoft for this venture, and they used some previous work by Google to build on. If you want to use, uh, for example, Gemini by Google, um, I'm comfortable using Gemini. I have not played with Gemini yet, but I will be comfortable using it because Google has all my information anyway. I mean, that's just how it is, all right? Um, so choose the corporation that may have your information already, and I suggest you start there. So let's see. Hold on. So let me check the chat real quick before we move on. Uh, and while we do that... I'm going to put this link in the chat to uh, chat GPT. So let's see, chat.openai.com. So if you want to play along at home, if you're interested in the home version of this game, go ahead and bring up OpenAI in another window and, um, and you can start tinkering around with it. So now let's check this. I log in with my Gmail, but is this not the best method? Again, it depends on your comfort level, uh, you know, sharing things. Uh, so if you're comfortable with that, you can, okay? Uh, so just, you know, think about that. Uh, is that tied into your campus email? Is that giving, you know, is that making a tie that you might not want to make? Um, let's see. Are the prompts for other content we put into something like chat used to train the AI? Yes, it is. Yep, and I think I covered that briefly after you posted that. Yes, what we put in, what it gives back, they will, they can use. And I've seen, uh, I've had times where it gives me two results side by side. It's usually just one column. And I had a, a response once where it gave me two columns side by side with two different responses. Tell, tell us which one you like better so that we can train better. Oh, I see Maureen was in there. Thank you, Maureen. Okay, so let's move on. All right, so now we're going to put it to work. You can watch. You can play along. You have the link. Um, so basic stuff. And I'm going to start with something really basic. Okay. We're not going to get into, you know, what Bloom's taxonomy, uh, anything like that in here. We're going to go the human element and just pressing the buttons and what works and what doesn't. So here's the deal. In the United States, we waste roughly 38% of the food we buy every year. I can't even translate that into billions of meals. I used to know it, but I forgot on purpose. Okay. And a very human problem. We waste food oftentimes simply because we're looking in our refrigerator and we have things left over that we don't think go together. Well, uh, there are websites you could go and enter that information if you can find them, but now we could do it with something like uh, GPT. Little side note, you could also use GPT to find recipes. 
which is interesting. You still want to test your recipe, read it over and make sure it makes sense. But not a bad solution as opposed to going out to the internet and finding all the websites that have the three pages of story, you know, like great grandma and where this recipe came from. If you're not into that and you just want the information, GPT will do that for you. So we've played with this one in the office. I, I love this one. This one's fun. Okay, so if you're in GPT right now, feel free to do this. So just list some random ingredients for and tell it you want a recipe. See what it kicks back to you. And look, because it'll add things. And then see if you want to take something out or change something. Okay, any kind of variations. And then if you're happy with it, you can copy paste it. And if you've never been in that environment, I'm going to show you that in a minute. So I'm going to change my share over to GPT. Okay, so let's see. There you are. Okay, I am in 3.5 right now. I can hop over to four real quick if we need to. If you've never seen it, a little walkthrough. So at the bottom center, you have your text box where you can just drop in a prompt and go from there. But if you keep doing this, you keep coming back to chat and you just keep throwing things in here, you get this long, this long process of like, well, now I'm talking about this, now I'm talking about that. So on the top left, you have the option for new chat. And you'll notice below that, you see a history of some of my past chats. So new chat, top left. If you've gone for uh, 4.0, you have the options there. Okay. Let's see. Um, and then working down, we now have integrations going. OpenAI has started to tie in uh, to other things like Kayak for booking vacations, uh, Canva for, for image creation, slide creation, right? And there's more in here. Explore GPTs, you go into there, color analysis, diagrams, book creator, movies. These were tested gradually. The initial tests were uh, a company would propose a tie-in, an integration, and what OpenAI would do is like, okay, we're going to make an experimental uh, experimental integration. Your limit is 15 or 30 people, somewhere around there. Let's do it and see how it goes. Okay. They were being they were being cautious. All right, this is the idea of keep AI from directly accessing the internet. Uh, right, and that's one is the lesson of Tay, and getting uh, you know trolling. The other is just the concept of letting the dust settle on internet content. At its current point, 3.5 does not pull anything, uh, doesn't have access to anything later than I believe January 22. And 4, or four has access to information up to April of, April of last year, April of 23. Okay. And it doesn't have access to all the internet, just certain sources that are fed to it. And we don't know what the sources are. That keeps the trolls from uh, flooding a, a website or a source with inaccurate information. Right. You're exactly right, Maureen. Yep, it's not connected to the internet. It has to go through something. Yep, there we go. Okay, great. Okay, so in the chat, I see a recipe. Todd, lamb, bubblegum, ginger ale, chocolate. That's intriguing. Oh, that's intriguing. The one we did in the office, let me get that one for you. So we did roughly expired ramen. That was a key term, expired. Um, then we had like ground beef. Soy, um, bum, 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 bum. we had brown rice, and oop, spelling. And then we had stuff like carrots, uh, cucumber, and you know we can throw other things in there. But let's uh, so let's uh, create a recipe for that. Create a recipe using yeah yeah.
Let's change that soy to soy sauce. I was abbreviating. There we go. All right. Let's see what it wants to give me today. So let's see. While that is loading, I see in the chat. You don't see those options, but uh, you only use three, five. Yes. Uh, Maureen, do you see Kayak and Canva in there or no? Okay. Yep. January 22. There we go. Yep. Thank you. I see that for the update. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. So um, these tie-ins, I'm using 3.5 now, and I have those. If I go to 4, it's going to give me Dolly. Uh, it's going to expand my time limit. Uh, things like, Or it's not expand my time limit. It's going to expand how much I can put in, but it does put me on a time limit because it's so powerful. Okay. okay. So I'm not sure why you're not seeing those then. Um, interesting. We'll have to play. Okay. Uh, Cause I didn't do any, I didn't make any changes for those to show up. They just kind of came in. Maybe that is kind of there because of four. Let me do something real quick in a second here, but first let's finish. So um, finish this example, then we'll move on. So I'm going to check my recipe, Asian inspired beef and vegetable stir fry with brown rice. Okay. Sounds safe. Good. Let's take a look. Uh, ramen discard. Now notice how it kept the word expired in there. And this is what we found in the office was, it didn't say anything about expired ingredients. It's just, yeah, sure, go ahead, use them. This is why you can't trust AI sometimes. Uh, I went and did a follow-up prompt one time. said, well, what about this expired ramen? And, and it gave the disclaimer of like, oh, be careful using expired things. Maybe you shouldn't, da 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 But it didn't give me that at first. So let's see. And this is another, another thing it does. It tends to add things, like I mentioned. So this time it added garlic. So you can say, okay, do this without the garlic. Uh, I don't have green onions, okay, but if I did, maybe I hadn't thought of it, so I can throw those in. Right. And then instructions. And again, I can go and uh, and change it, take out this, substitute that. What are my options? Okay, so let's do, um, what are my options instead of soy sauce? Let's see if it comes up with something. Yep, coconut, fish sauce, Worcestershire, miso paste, hoisin. So, yeah, so we have some options there. The big thing about AI and about GPT is it's a process. You don't give it one prompt and expect everything to be fine. You give it a prompt, you refine that prompt, you humanize it, you make it your own. Okay. Okay, so it looks like a lot of people are not seeing those other options. Okay, then you don't have to worry about them. Uh, if you go for four, you might see them show up. Let's see. There we go. And Ruth has posted a link in there so you can see the list. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Okay. So that's our basic example of like, let's just get our feet wet. Now let's go back and look at something else. Oh, I see people are popping stuff in. Oh, okay, we're good. I saw a few people posted things in the Q&A. We're just gonna use the chat, not the Q&A today. Uh, but that was early stuff. We already took care of that. Okay, so let's go back to our PowerPoint and let's look at something else. Excellent, okay. All right, so that's a fun, easy one. You get some entertaining things. Jamie. Expired ramen is a live perpetuated by Big Ramen. Oh, thank you. I always forget about Big Ramen. <laughs> okay, let's go with something uh, a little bit different. You can use this for personal life. You can use this for work. This is uh, truly one of my favorite examples because it really brings in the human element. It really speaks to me on a, on a primal level, okay? As much as technology can. So composing an email. Okay, even when we want to write the email, sometimes it's hard to get started. Uh, and the top example, the reluctant email, the email we don't want to send. That's the toughest one to get started. That's the best one for GPT. And we'll take a look at an example of that in a moment here. The recurring topic. Think about it. Many of us have boilerplates that we use to respond to students or to coworkers or whatever uh, for specific things that we've done over decades. Um, I 
I can't use boilerplates because every time I do, I, I just end up with a whole new email. Okay. So for the recurring topic, instead of relying on a boilerplate, throw it into GPT. Tell them what you generally want it to say. It'll kick out an answer, and then you can adjust that to add this idea, add that idea, make this more formal, make this less formal. And now, when you have to write a similar email to that same person four years from now, they're not going to be like, huh, this looks familiar, because GPT gives you a different result every time. And I have been, uh, I've put the, the same prompt in. Uh, I have two accounts. I've put the same prompt in with different accounts, different results. I've put the same prompt in with the same account in different times, different results. Oh, and now we're seeing in the chat. Yep, yep. People are using it for other stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, and Jason, you're getting into the, yeah, lesson plans, discussion prompts. Yeah. Yep. In the later, more uh, more specific sessions that are offered, in fact, too, uh, some of those will be discussed. And then um, when we get to CIT, if you're going to CIT in Buffalo in May, I'll be talking about some of those, too. I'm going to do a session there as well. And that's when I get out of this, and there will be some of this, but then I get more into, like, let's put it to work in higher ed, okay? So the reluctant one. If you want another uh, play along at home, this is a good one to do. So we need a rejection letter. One of the worst things to write, right? So try this in chat if you're playing along. Try writing uh, a rejection letter to Jane Admin regarding a job listing. You can make it whatever job you want, okay? And then, okay, so then it will give you results. And then you come back with your second prompt of like, you know what, mention that she has a strong resume, but the job needs a different skill set or something. Put it in your own words. Prompt three, you can add encouragement, make it more or less formal. Okay. So I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna walk through that one. So let's do a different share here. And let's go back to GPT. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. All right. So top left, new chat, compose a rejection letter for Jane Edmond regarding, uh, let's go instructional designer. Instantly it kicks out a suggested letterhead. Great. Company letterhead, date, to it's to, address zip, great. Thank you for your interest, company name. And uh, there's one thing I didn't do in the last one uh, that I did not mention. I wanted to get into this one and I'll mention it here. So we have to do our edits, right? This gives us these blanks. So we can't do the edits in here. I mean, we could give it a different prompt of like mention your, your company, but you could also go when it gives you a response, you can go to the bottom. And you see these icons up here. You can have it read it to you. You can copy it to a clipboard. You can regenerate, or you can say bad response. This is not what I was looking for. And if you do that, that's helpful. If it's not giving you what you're looking for. Do it. That makes it better for all of us in the long run. All we would do is copy it. Click copy, puts it in a clipboard, open up uh, Google Docs, Word, uh, you know, Mac pages, whatever you want. Drop it in there personalize it, make it, make it your own. So let's do a uh, bum, 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 uh, mention her strong resume. Let's see. So now, yep, there you go. Add encouragement to apply for other positions. I won't do all those right now, but I think if you if you play with it, you'll see what we get here um, and how it can change. Uh, make more or less formal. Okay, I did that one. I love doing that one for um, one of the other examples I have that we're going to get to in a minute. Okay, so uh, so now you're seeing the process. Okay. This is the general process of GPT. Put in a generic prompt. Uh, yes, you can create strong prompts, and there is a, there is an art to that, and there's a way to like try different things to so you have to do less revising. I like the revising. Then I don't have to do all my thinking beforehand. I can be like, here's just what I need. 
here's the basic idea. Now I get to reflect. Oh yeah, I need this. Oh yeah, I need that. Oh, let's add this. Oh, let's take that out. It allows me to work from my gut instinct and build in once it gives me something to play with. Let's go back. And sure, there we go. The letter of recommendation follows the same process. Okay, another example of how you could use it beyond emails. I create a letter of recommendation for Jane Admin, newer five years, proactive worker, uh, come back later, add that she was involved in multiple charities or you know, whatever personal things, make this more or less formal, and then copy to clipboard, shift it, or yeah, control shift paste, drop it, or just uh, control paste, control C, if you're on a Mac, command C, or no, command V, that would be it. And you can drop it in to a different document. The more or less formal can get really fun. GPT tries to give us what we want. I did what this once, or I've done this a few times. The first time I did it was the best result ever. It'll never be duplicated, I don't think. I'm like, make this less formal. And it came back in the second paragraph or third paragraph. It started with, Jane Admin leaves a trail of fairy dust whenever she enters a room. I loved it. I could never use it for a letter recommendation, but just the fact that chat decided to go for it and try to give me something like that, I thought it was beautiful. So let's see. So um, let me take a check, uh, take a check at the chat here. Uh, Megan, yeah. Yeah, the link in the about, LinkedIn about section, definitely. Yes, thank you. Stacy, Gemini, Google to write job descriptions and collect develop. Yes, yeah. Right. See, once you get into this and you st you start using the same idea, the same process, but now you can see you can apply to a lot of different things. You get into the classroom, you can use GPT to create rubrics for you. I love doing that. Create a rubric, and then I go back as the subject matter expert and go, no, I mean this. If we compose, uh, so let's see, Todd, if we compose emails with AI, should we acknowledge that in the email? Uh, I always say you use uh, AI as your starting point to organize your thoughts. Then you go, and that's why you take it out into a different document and make it your own. Okay. In an email, you know, usually we don't cite sources in an email, so I wouldn't, but I absolutely would not use just my GPT results or my AI results. I'm just using it to get the ball rolling. Okay. When I write that letter of rejection, in the end, I am always going to personalize it because I feel that person deserves that. AI just got me past that inertia and that reluctance to sting a, a human being like that. Yeah, okay, so I see rubrics are mentioned in the chat, so I'm just checking. Yeah, the chat's moving fast, awesome. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, Megan, if you see something recurring, let me know at the end and we'll talk about that, okay? Okay, sounds good. Great, thank you. Okay. So beyond letter of recommendation. More involved uses. And again, this is not click along. This is actually, What's going on in the chat right now? I love this. Presentation organizer. All right. And two examples, right? College orientation. There's so many things going on. You know, what do you, what do you want for incoming students? If you've done these sessions before, if you've run orientations, you know what you want, but it helps to see everything on a screen and go, oh, maybe I didn't think about that. Or this doesn't work for us because of this. The second one. Primary topics, you know, getting topics for a presentation in your field. This one is great. All right. So let me put my historian hat on. So I tested this. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do, I want a presentation on upheaval in uh, France, pre and post French Revolution. I can sit and write that out. That's no problem. Chat, what would you do? And it gave me 10 topics. I'm like, okay, move this topic later in the presentation. Take this other topic out. You've just given me an idea for another topic I can add in. And uh, and I'll give you one of the one of the examples. So in my 
in my uh, lectures and classes on the French Revolution, throughout it, woven throughout those lessons, are genders. Okay. How did it affect different people in society depending on their gender? And what were their reactions and their opinions? Well, chat didn't know that, so it put it as a topic as far as women in the French Revolution. I'm like, wonderful. I tie that in throughout, but I would like at a point where I reiterate and I bring that all together to make it uh, very clear for my first year students. Now, I am going to mention something else since I just talked about gender. An important thing to keep in mind with GPT and AI, its sources. Again, we don't know its sources because it doesn't have access to the full internet. It has specific things that it is fed. But consider our world. Consider, you know, patriarchal society, all right? Consider all the writings that got published by males, right, that were not published by females. AI is going to be skewed because it is getting skewed information. Keep that in mind all the time, all right? I have known others who have put in uh, descriptions of what would make a good person for a certain career field. And GPT came up with he because, say, 1950s America or before, it was a role that traditionally would have gone to men. Okay. Not like that anymore. So watch out for that. Keep these things in mind. Be aware of our cognitive biases. Be aware of how they might feed AI. Uh, colonialism, cultural uh, appropriation. I've seen all those just right in there. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, we're all in higher ed. Reflect, right? So, uh, yeah, so there's another example of what we can do. Segue. Now I'm going to look at something, uh, tying it in with something else. And this is one I found when I was uh, researching an, in a, an earlier presentation for uh, the Center for Professional Development, a presentation I gave in December. And what, I, what they wanted me to do there was, a, let's do AI for people who are not in the classroom. How could we use it in our job? And as I went through and I experimented, I came up with this one. Take the chat, save the chat from a Zoom meeting. And you will find these buttons in a couple places. When I first created this, they were showing up in the bottom center in the chat box below where you would type in your text, free buttons. Click that, save chat. Now it is showing up in me, or for me, in the top right next to the title of this workshop. So look for the three dots, the ellipses, wherever you find them, click on them. One of your options, probably a top option will be save chat. You can grab the chat and then analyze it later. I've done this. I actually did this with presentations, with AI presentations. What are the recurring questions? What is the positive feedback? What is the negative feedback? What emojis showed up in the chat and how often? You can go back and resort. If you want to take this a little farther, how about using it with the captions? All right, when you come into Zoom, if it's activated uh, in the Zoom toolbar, you will have the option for closed captioning or the three dots, the ellipses above the word more, and the option captions, start captions. And then if you have the captions going for the whole session, you can save them. In a presentation like this, where it's mostly one person talking, good. I could use it to analyze my speech patterns, analyze my topics, say, do I want to change anything? But if you're in a group meeting and you have multiple people talking, now you come back at the end, save the, save the captions, then go and analyze it. Think about an apartment meeting or an office meeting. And now everybody has chimed in, given their opinion, given their viewpoint on a specific topic at different times in that meeting. For example, in a lot of meetings, it's like, I'm scheduled to talk, next person talks, next person talks, next person talks. Great. GPT, analyze this by topics instead of speaker. 
get the recurring themes, get what was said, and then you can re reorganize the information in a way that you can uh, digest in a different way. Okay. So let's see. Um, if you do this, be mindful of privacy. Right? Whenever you enter anything in, uh, you know, consider your privacy levels. What's going on in this chat? If this is a work thing, fine. If this is uh, if this was a Department of Defense meeting, you would not do this. Okay, defense subcontractor, you would not be doing this. But for us, if we're discussing just themes or things, programs we want to use for our department, uh, you know, then we can do that. Okay, so let's see. So now, yeah, we're we're getting we're gonna we're gonna start wrapping it up now. We're gonna start pulling it in. But before I do that, some food for thought. Additional possibilities. I mentioned the idea of a Zoom chat. Well, uh, there are times where you have shared documents. When I was at the CPD, we had a shared document where everyone put in what they're working on in the week, what were their updates, any time off they had coming up, blah, 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 that kind of thing. Well, we could take a document like that, drop it into GPT. Again, have it analyzed for themes. Have it list the dates that people will not be around so we know not to schedule a meeting then. That sort of thing. GPT and quantitative data. You may have seen uh, GPT is not too great with numbers. Here is a beautiful thing I just learned last night. I saw an article. Apparently, I haven't gotten to test this yet, but I do trust the article and I am absolutely going to dive in and try this. If you tell G GPT to pretend it is a Star Trek character, its math is better. I don't know why. But um, so that's what I'm going to start playing with next. Still, it's not the best with numbers. With quantitative data, I will tell you this, it does not directly interact with Excel at this point, unless they've made a change in the last week. Uh, but you can go into Excel, if you're comfortable with Excel, export as a CSV, comma separated values. GPT will take a CSV file and analyze it. I have done this with hurricane patterns in Florida for the last 15 years. Like, okay, what are the trends? What's the percentage of a hurricane in May versus June versus blah, blah, blah. Image creation or analysis. There have been updates. It will create images, and it has done that uh, for a while now. There are issues with the images it creates. It has a problem, uh, well, various things. If you're doing uh, a graphic, I've seen it spell things wrong. There's something about if you if it turns into a graphic, it will misspell things at times. I've seen it not get you know the idea of what we're talking about and not be able to readjust and give me exactly what I was looking for. Uh, but it can create images and you can refine them. It has a problem with image creation in that it does things, for example, it will create extra hands or limbs. So I've had you know the three-handed otter, the five-legged moose, all sorts of interesting things. What's intriguing is now those images, as we build a collection of images and we share them through the internet, as GPT goes through updates and gets access to later points of internet access, depending on its sources, it could end up with those images as a reference. Welcome to the six-legged moose. Welcome to the five-armed otter. Because it realizes, given its information, the number of hands in an otter is variable. Right? So we can see in intriguing things happen there. It can analyze images. It can read the text off of images now. It can analyze if you give it an image of a stack of blocks and you take one block away. It can hypothesize what happens to the rest of them. In the early days, it would not, it would not get it right. It was like, you would have a structure without that block at the bottom. It's like, okay, but gravity, what happens? And then what comes next? GPT-5, I mentioned. It's supposed to have better reasoning capability based off of, I'm assuming, what they're getting from results for us and are we giving it the thumbs down or not? Uh, their experiments in the background. I mean, think of it now that they've opened it up uh, with GPT-3.5 on such a massive scale, they can bring in a lot of information to refine. GPT-5, like I said, is also supposed to have, uh, theoretically, rumor is it will have video capability. 
but we shall see. And let's see. Okay, so we're going to start wrapping it up. One more. Here's where we go. Again, remember the tyranny of choice. Sunni is offering a lot here because Sunni wants all of us to have options. And you can find options, uh, presentations from the educational services platforms. Okay, I've gone to webinars run by Educause or uh, Go to Knowledge. Okay, different things, different entities are putting out their own presentations so you can get a different angle. If you're not sure where to go, I recommend what you some of what you see here, if not all of it, but you decide. The sessions I did, the session I did today, session the same one I did last Tuesday, that's week one of five. I hand it off now. I hand off the baton, and next week it will be uh, potentials and pitfalls of AI. Same times, Tuesday ten, Friday one. Potentials, pitfalls of AI in the classroom, I believe. Uh, we have then, uh, you know, considerations for a syllabus statement on AI for your course. We have. AI as an assistant, as a helper, students using AI. And then the last uh, last one we have would be AI and content creation for your course. So along with that, at CIT in Buffalo, the first day, uh, Tuesday, there is a pre-conference being held by FACT2. And there will be speakers there from FACT2 talking about AI, what results have they found? Uh, what are they seeing on different campuses? Uh, you know, where do we go from here? And what resources are already out there for you? PEZ webinars, and we're not sure if this is running next Tuesday, but this past Tuesday at two o'clock, uh, the Professional Education Services ran a webinar uh, on AI, another foundation one. Uh, similar to mine, uh, hit some topics I didn't. You know, we kind of like put them together and you get some really neat uh, different viewpoints of similar things. So look for those announcements coming out from the SUNY Center for Professional Development or from your campus as a professional development opportunity. The CPD and FACT2 have sponsored courses, AI courses. If you go to sunycpd.eventsair.com slash AI, you can register for their courses uh, where instructors will walk you through in Brightspace and you'll have access to information to help you get comfortable with AI. Getting back to Buffalo in CIT, I have a workshop that Thursday at 8.45 a.m. Okay, um, I can do it, 8.45, I can do this. Pathways to AI adoption, putting GPT to work for you. Again, I'm gonna start looking more into the classroom. So I'm gonna have my foundation stuff, You know, best practices will be glossed over quickly. And then we go in as a workshop and we play together and we compare things, but it's be live instead of having to put things in a chat. Okay. So with that, let's take a look at the chat. Um, recording going out, excellent, thank you. Okay, so Megan, did you see anything in there? I see uh, one about hallucinations. Um, yeah, I don't get into hallucinations too much, Jason. I mentioned the, uh, the ones about the extra limbs and such. Uh, I tend to stay away from those. I like to put in, like, look, be aware that this can happen and that you have to check everything but I don't get into the hallucinations because sometimes that makes people more apprehensive to tinker with AI before they even get started. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Well, that was that was going to be the only one that I think I'm I saw. Um, beautiful. Oh, I see Maureen. Uh, somebody mentioned and Maureen responded about sources. Yes, watch your sources with AI. It makes up sources. It credits sources it does not use. Um, I have, if people have put information into uh, GPT and asked it, did you create this? And GPT proudly said yes, when no, it did not create it. Uh, down in Texas, we had, I saw faculty get in trouble for that one, using chat GPT as a way to ascertain uh, academic integrity. GPT said, sure, I wrote it. And that caused a problem when the grades reflected something GPT said that was not accurate. Let's see. So Maureen generates text based on the most probable answer. Yes, it does. And that's why we have a problem with AI detectors. 
uh, Turnitin says that theirs is not 100% foolproof. All right. It works on the probability of did you know this word following that word following that word. So yes, it's scouring resources, but then it's trying to put something together for you that will reflect what it thinks you want. As far as what it thinks you want, I will touch on that briefly. As you can see, it's not perfect. I love to give people this example. If you're a classroom instructor, AI cannot replace you for multiple reasons. One is the concept of RSI, regular and substantive interaction and instructor presence. The other is, you know your subject better than chat GPT, hands down, and you can get it to contradict itself. I did it with music. I asked it, what's the best guitar solo of all time? And we won't get into that one in the chat. It just said one of the most recognized ones as being, you know, best of all time is the solo to Stairway to Heaven. And I'm like, okay, analyze it for me. Tell me the theory behind it, the scales. And then I saw something in what it said in the first four measures about what scale. And I'm like, okay, but there's subscales, subset. And I'm like, okay, but does it use this subset? And it said, yes. So now it uses a scale and it uses a subset. And I'm like, okay, but technically there's another note in there that doesn't belong. So I'm like, well, what does it use? Does it use this subset? I got it to say yes to all three. If you gave that, if a student had to analyze a piece of music and it said, yes, it uses natural minor. Yes, it uses minor pentatonic. And yes, it uses uh, the hexatonic major. We would have a problem and you would see it a mile away as an instructor. Yeah. Okay, so. If you have any questions at this point, um, I'm going to say, please. Oh, there we go. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry. At the end of the chat, I'm seeing people put in the solos. Absolutely. Paula Freebird, thank you. Oh, you are my people. This is awesome. <laughs> All right, everyone. For those of you who uh, want to sign off, we have about three minutes left. Uh, I'm going to say thank you. I see a hand is raised. I'll I'll touch on that in a second here, if that is still up. Yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, for those of you who need to sign off, thank you for being here. If you have questions, I'll stay on for another couple minutes. Remember, we have these, um, these are being offered, the follow-ups the next few weeks. Uh, let's see, I saw something. We do not do certification for this. A recording will be made available at some point. And then I see a hand up. If you want to come off mute and ask me a question, that'd be great. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. This is Hello. Awesome. Hello. Uh, can I ask you one question? Very important. Yes. Good. My name is uh, Dr. Tespa from uh, Farming Dale State College. Okay. Um, well, uh, there are two opposing forces are united here. That is uh, artificial intelligence, which is a technology, and the human brain yes uh now if we depend too much on uh, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. what are we going to miss the other side which is the human brain right because as you know rob the human brain is like an athlete if you practice if you critically think if you uh, repeatedly do things Mm -hmm. uh, including research, then you will find your brain will be very rich. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be well trained. Mm -hmm. uh, but like what you showed us, we I don't know really, not I don't know, rather I need help and uh, I need to do my homework. At least what is my job and what is the uh, AI job? Yes. How will we reconcile them? Uh, why is that? Because uh, the brain training Mm -hmm. The brain uh, ability of thinking, ability of uh, discovering, innovation, critical thinking will be under question mark. Uh, why? Because the border, we, mm -hmm. how we can uh, reconcile both of them mm -hmm. and special instructors like you, myself, and everybody here, when we are co conducting research, we need you know, the writing skills, the critical thinking skills, the problem solving skills, the mm -hmm. innovation, the discovery. Yeah. So I here's may maybe here's, diminish it. The, so here's my, my approach. Question. So uh, the yeah. second one. Sorry, second one. Secondly, okay. yep. if we ask 
uh, chat GPT, mm -hmm. it will give us recommendations like what he, did, he said, mm -hmm. but there are other external factors yes. uh, involved here. For example, ideology, economic system, yeah. whatever, many, many other things. So for if you can say anything about this, thank you. So you'll notice that uh, in my examples and everything I say, I'm like, you can use it as a way to fight inertia. And especially for us as subject matter experts, you have a lot of knowledge. And uh, if you want to create something without, you know, say you're in the time, you know, the time constraint and you don't have time to sit and write everything out, which is what I love to do. I love to go back and go, I'm going to write everything out again. I'm going to build this presentation from scratch again because it works my neural network, right? It works, uh, you know, works my brain. Uh, so for that, yes, we need to be mindful. We cannot use it as um, a crutch. We cannot become reliant on it. Uh, just like if we use, uh, you know, if we use something to help move us from one place to another physically when we could walk it, muscles atrophy. So I say use it where it's applicable, where it helps you, but don't rely on it. And I will tell you this, I, I love to throw in this fact, all of this presentation, zero AI in the prep. I went through it old school. I walked through it, I researched, I tinkered. The only AI that came in is when you saw me in chat GPT playing with it. So yes, very good points. Thank you for adding those. Um, did anybody else have questions that they want to address? I see my, my email went out. Please send me email, ask questions. Okay, I love to have these conversations. We are actually out of time for today. So if you want to have a talk about anything, please send me an email. We'll talk back and forth, okay? Um, so with that, uh, Megan, I think we covered everything, right? Yep, I'm just seeing a lot of thank yous in the chat um, and just folks kind of wrapping up some discussions, but I don't think I saw any other questions that you missed. Great, well then what I'm going to do now is go to those three dots in the chat and save the chat for myself. And if you want to, feel free to do the same. You'll find links, you'll find questions and answers from other people, okay? Perfect. And I'm gonna stop the recording. Okay.